All right, well, good morning. Everybody excited to be here this morning? Yeah, yeah it's going to be a great day. Um, so, my name is Flint Funkhauser. I am the youth pastor here at New Point Church, and uh, I get the privilege of speaking to you this morning. We are continuing on this series that Cal started last week uh, called After Amen. And so, if you weren't here last week, I just kind of want to give you a couple bullet points about kind of what Cal started us off with. Uh, he kicked us off basically about not wasting in the wait. How a, a waiting season in our life doesn't necessarily have to be a wasted season in our life, right? That was his main idea. And so Kyle walked through the model prayer given to us in Scripture by Jesus, and he walked, we, he, he walked through us with us that last week basically to tell us, like, it doesn't have to just be something that we recite um, right before we get out into the, the basketball court or the, uh, the football field or anything like that. This can be a prayer that we use daily uh, to approach Jesus. And so um, this, these next 21 days, so these next, I guess, 14 days, we're going through a season of called, called 21 Days of Prayer. And so on Saturdays, I'd like to invite everybody uh, here to join us. Saturday mornings from 9 to 10, we, we do a thing called Saturday Morning Prayer. And Cheyenne, Kyle's wife, this Saturday actually walked through the model prayer and kind of showed us how we can do that um, in our prayer lives. And so if you, if you have time, carve out an hour of your morning, Saturdays from 9 to 10, it's well worth it, Okay. And so last week, Kyle started us off. This week, we're going to uh, continue on in this series. And really what we're going to look at today is, is how God wants to use us after amen, right? How God wants to use me and you as agents of change in our world, in the, in the ways that God has placed and gifted us in our lives, okay? So I titled this lesson this morning, uh, Faithful to Follow. Faithful to Follow. After amen, you and I need to be faithful to follow in the prayers that we've prayed, Right? And, the, and the things that we're currently praying for and hoping to see God do, you and I need to be faithful to, to follow through on those prayers, right? That if God says, hey, you got it, and he wants to use you, we need to be faithful to do those things. And so we're going to look at a story in Scripture uh, that's really a perfect example of this today. And it's found in the book of Nehemiah. Anybody ever heard of Nehemiah? Yeah, oh, great, good. We're going to teach you something new today. And so it's found in the Old Testament. Man's uh, name's Nehemiah. And if you've never heard of Nehemiah before, really, I'm just going to get to scratch the surface this morning about uh, who he was and the kind of legacy that he, that he uh, left for us. And so I would encourage you, it's a pretty short book, relatively easy read. So this week, if you've got some time, in your quiet time, in your alone time with Jesus, go ahead and read this book. It's a lot of great truths throughout, a lot of great lessons for me and you to apply. And so before we dive in, I want to give us a little bit of background on what, what's kind of happened to God's people. If, you, if you've ever read the New Old Testament, you kind of understand the Old Testament, uh, the, the Israelites that kind of went up and down in their walk with the Lord, right? They weren't always great at following what God wanted them to follow. And so uh, they kind of were in one of those battles, and they were in a foreign land. They were exiled because of this, okay? So the Babylonian Empire, if you've any got any, got any uh, history buffs out there, the Babylonian Empire had previously invaded Judah, where God's people were at, and went into Jerusalem and taken captive a lot of the Jewish people that were living there. And then what typically happens is they capture them and they took them back with them, right, to the Babylonian Empire. And so the Jewish people, majority of them, were living in exile away from Jerusalem. But here's the deal. God left a remnant in Jerusalem, right? God, God left a remnant of his people, a small group of his people still in Jerusalem. And so later, the Babylonian Empire would fall to the Persian Empire. Hopefully you've heard of them as well. Persia would later take over the Babylonian Empire, and the Jewish descendants, though, are still in exile there, right? And so that's kind of where we're uh, going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 1, is that God's people, majority of them, are living in exile underneath a foreign rulership, right? And that would be Persia. And so Ezra and Nehemiah, two books that uh, we kind of are talking through here today, uh, they tell the stories of three Jewish leaders who are going to go back to Jerusalem to kind of rebuild and, and help out God's people. And so the three Jewish leaders are named this, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and then Nehemiah. Okay? And they're going to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, rebuild the gates, and rebuild, rebuild the walls. And so our story today is the final story of those leaders, Nehemiah's. So here's the thing, though. Nehemiah is one currently in exile, okay, where we pick up. He's in Persia with them, uh, away from his home, away from God's people, and, uh, but God still has the remnant in Jerusalem. So if you've got your Bible today, go to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4 to start out with. 
Verse 1, it says this, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, during the month of Kislev in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that has survived the exile. And they said to me, The remnant in the, in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's walls have been broken down, and its gates have been burned. All right, so these first four verses kind of set the stage for where we're at, where we're going to start in our story today. Uh, Nehemiah is in exile in Persia, and his literal brother, Hanani, right, he comes back from a trip. And so typically, if you have a family member who takes a trip, a big trip, and comes back, what's your first reaction with with your family member? You're excited? And like, how was it, right? How was your trip? And so Nehemiah is kind of asking this question to his brother, hey, how's everybody back home, right? How's things going in Jerusalem? And he gets a pretty bad report, right, which would not be fun for you to to hear if you're Nehemiah. So look back at verse 3. Here's the bad report. They are in great trouble and disgrace. So he hears his people are in great trouble and disgrace, and here's why. Their walls are broken down and their gates have been burned. So you might be thinking like, hey, that's no big deal. It's just walls and gates. Well, here's the deal. Back in old times, walls and gates were a huge deal, right? Anybody ever heard the story of Jericho? Yeah, that's how they got Kark was the walls came tumbling down, right? And so uh, their walls are broken down, their gates were burned down. Uh, it helps in an old-style city to have strong walls and strong gates, right? And so it helps to protect you, your people from what's outside, but also to fortify yourself inside. And so Nehemiah hears this report, and it says in Scripture that he immediately does what? He sits down, he weeps, begins to mourn, and then he does this. He begins to fast and to pray to the Lord, right? He begins to fast and pray and to fast and pray. Nehemiah prays that God will remember his people, and essentially he wants God to rescue his people from this bondage, from this captivity, from their walls being burned down. And so here's an important side note that we can't forget. Nehemiah is in exile, and he, his position in exile is this. He's a cupbearer to the king, the king of Persia, okay? He's a cupbearer. And so what that means is he has direct access probably most days of the week uh, to the king, right? He gets to approach the king. Now, uh, here, here's his real job, though. He's a cupbearer, which means he gets to taste test all of the liquids, all of the wine, all the drinks, and make sure that they are not poisonous, okay? So pretty fun job, right? Anybody sign enough to be that guy? No, right? Here's the deal. Probably wouldn't get a good life insurance policy with a job like that, would you? You just swallow something bad, you're just gone. Too bad for you, okay? And so Nehemiah prays and fasts and prays and fasts uh, in this situation. And here's the deal. He doesn't just do this for two days, right? He doesn't just seek the Lord's approval for a week. He doesn't just seek the Lord's approval for 21 days even, which we're, we're currently in. This is for about 90 to 150 days that Nehemiah is continually seeking, fasting, and praying to God in heaven. That's a long time, right? 90 to 150 days seeking the Lord. And so God brings Nehemiah this opportunity, okay? Nehemiah's been praying. He's been praying and praying, looking for an opportunity. And God brings Nehemiah a tailor-made opportunity before the king. Let's look at that now. Go to chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, During the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence, and so the king said to me, Why are you sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, May the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, What is your request? So I prayed to the God in the heavens, and, the, and answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I may rebuild it. All right, these verses bring us to our first point to the day, is that me and you, we need to be faithful to follow even when it doesn't make sense. We need to be faithful to follow even when it doesn't make sense. Nehemiah has been praying, he's been praying, he's been praying and praying and praying for four to five months of praying and fasting, seeking the Lord, seeking for God to make a way for his people, to rescue his people, and to restore his people. And so here Nehemiah is before the king, and this is like a tailor-made opportunity for him, right? He does this very often, okay, every time that the king needs to get a drink. But here's the deal. 
this is the only time, to our knowledge, that the king really asks him, hey, what's up, right? Why are you sad? And, and so it's in that moment that you probably got to think, Nehemiah recognizes, hey, something's different today, right? This is my moment to approach the king. Something's different. And so it's in that moment that I like to think, has Nehemiah been praying all along, God, I pray for our people in Jerusalem and that somebody else would go and make a way, right? Somebody else would go build, build those walls back, or somebody else would go rescue those people. Do you think Nehemiah's been praying more like that, or has he been praying differently? Has he been saying, hey, God, use me, right? I want to be the one to go back and rebuild the walls. I want to be the one to go back and change uh, and, and re replenish the gates. And so I think it's in this moment that Nehemiah kind of firmly sees, hey, God's called me. God's equipped me. God's burdened my heart to go back and restore Jerusalem, to go restore the walls, right? He's, he kind of sees in this moment of realization, I can do this. This is my calling. This is the burden God's given me. But let's look at Nehemiah's reaction, because a lot of times when God calls you, uh, you're not as joyful as you might hope sometimes, right? So look, look at Nehemiah's reaction, verse 2. It says, I was overwhelmed with fear. I was overwhelmed with fear. So here's, if we're being honest with ourselves, right? God calls you to something. We've all been here before, right? We respond in fear a lot of times, right? Or is that just me? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of times if you, if you are called by God to something, it can be nerve-wracking, right? You can, you can, all those questions and doubts can fill your head and your mind like, am I good enough? Do I measure up? Am I knowledgeable enough to lead other people? Is my life too messed up to be an agent of change? And so whenever God called me into ministry as a sophomore in college, like, there was one part of me that was really excited, right, because my parent, my, my dad was in ministry, my mom worked at a church, but there was another part of me that was like, oh no, right, that means I'm going to have to uh, lead other people, that my life's going to have to be an example to others, and that means I'm going to have to someday get in front of a crowd like you and preach, right, that my pastor's going to ask me to preach in front of people, and so truthfully, I still get overcome with fear, right, and a lot of us probably in this room, we still get overcome with fear acknowledging what God's called us to do. But sadly, here's the deal. This is where a lot of people stop. This is where a lot of people choose to stop what God's called them to do and not continue and press on and, and move past that. They can't get past fear, right? Nehemiah does not just stop at fear. He doesn't stop at fear. But sometimes we can see God's answer. We can see that God's called us. We can see that God's equipped us. And then we choose to say this, God, that sounds great but call somebody else, please, right? I can't do that. Somebody else can. It's too difficult for me. Somebody else has probably got it more equipped. I'll keep praying, though, for somebody else to go do that, right? I'll keep praying, though, for somebody else to go back to Jerusalem and, and rebuild those walls. Here's the deal. It's scary. It's scary when we feel unqualified. But I want you to, to take an uh, example from Nehemiah today. Think about this. Nehemiah's occupation is what? He's a cupbearer, right? He's a cupbearer. He tastes test wine for a living, right? He doesn't lead people. He doesn't rebuild cities. Those are things that he's not really qualified for. But yet, here we find God's calling Nehemiah, a cupbearer, to go and do those things, to lead people and to rebuild cities. Clearly, we see that God has a different calling on his life. And I love this because how does Nehemiah respond just three short verses later? Look at verse 5. So he's overcome with fear, right? Overcome with fear. Now look at verse 5. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor with you, look at this, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. Send me so that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah accepts the call from God even if it didn't make sense, right? Even if he was just a cupbearer, he still accepts this call. Nehemiah goes from a cupbearer to a king, an earthly king, to a contractor for the king, right? God in heaven. Here's the deal. His purpose changes, right? He's no longer just doing an earthly job or fulfilling an earthly task. Now he is called by God for heaven, heavenly things, right? Kingdom work. I think this is an excellent example for me and you uh, that a lot of times me and you, we pray and we pray and we pray and pray and we feel like God's not answering our prayers. Here's the deal. I want you to shift your thinking. Maybe God is not answering the prayers how you want them answered. You know what I'm saying? Maybe God wants to answer your prayers in his way, in his will. And I would ask you to be, to be open to that. How is God wanting to answer your prayers in his way? If Nehemiah was looking for somebody else to step up and to lead this charge back to Jerusalem, if he, if he would have kept praying for somebody else to go do this, he could have been praying and fasting for another four to five months, right? He could have, no one ever could have stepped up. And keep in mind, there's a Jewish remnant 
that's pretty much dependent upon somebody else coming and helping them out, right, to rebuild these walls and these gates. And so what could have happened to the Jewish remnant? They could have been gone, right? They could have been conquered, taken into exile somewhere else. Who knows what would have happened to them? And so the point here is this, is that me and you, we need to be faithful to follow God even when it doesn't make sense, even when it doesn't make sense. If God is behind your call, you can trust in that. So I got a little uh, illustration I want to share with you to kind of help uh, drive this point home, hopefully. How many of you have ever uh, remember back in the day, way back when, when you learned to play baseball or softball way back when? Anybody ever remember those days? Okay. So there's a moment, uh, or you've taught your kids or anything like that, there's a moment whenever you go from a thing called coach pitch to little league, right? What, what's the big shift in that? Is that no longer is just soft toss happening from your coach. Now there's a nine-year-old other, on the other end of that ball throwing heaters at your head, you know what I'm saying? Like, they don't know which way it's going, they just know it's going fast, you know what I'm saying? And so I remember uh, going from this position in Little League, uh, go, come from coach pitch to Little League, and, uh, and it's kind of terrifying, right? Because they don't really have control over the ball. And what's the initial reaction for kids? They're first at bat. What do they do? They got to get away, right? So they're up to bat, and they do this. They do that job the whole time. You know what I'm saying? They just duck out, get out of the batter's box. They're fearful to step into the batter's box, right? And why? It's because they think that the ball is coming straight for their body. They think the ball is coming straight for their head. And here's, here's the point that I want to make. It's a natural reaction for kids to do that. It's a natural reaction for them to be scared the first few times they're in the batter's box. But here's the deal. They need to learn how to trust in their coach, that their, tr- that their coach has got their back, and he's going to say, hey, in order for you to fulfill your purpose, which is to hit the ball, you got to step in, stand in the batter's box, and be willing to swing the bat, right? It's not until they begin to trust in their coach that they're going to learn how to hit the ball properly. So the same way with this child in that silly scenario, they have to learn how to trust their little league coach, is the same thing that we need to learn today, right? We need to learn how to stand in and to, be, and to do what God has called us to do. We're going to have to trust our God with every situation. We're going we're gonna to need to not duck out in fear when God calls us, uh, but we're going to need to learn how to trust in our Lord and Savior. Okay? And so Nehemiah asked the king, and the king accepts his request, and now we're going to fast forward to the building project, right? There's a lot there. God provides for his people. It's awesome. Go back and read it. We can't do it today, okay? And so Nehemiah gets the, gets the okay. Now he's going to go build. And I want you to understand this. Everybody in here should know this, but if you don't, let me share it. Just because God's called you to something doesn't mean that everybody's going to be excited about that calling. You know what I'm saying? doesn't mean that your family is going to be excited about that calling or your best friend's going to be excited about that calling. I teach uh, junior high and high school students, and there's a lot of times in youth whenever a kid can get excited about their Lord and Savior and they can go to school and want to change their school, and guess what? They get shut down by their friends, right, because they're a Jesus follower now and God's changing their life. That can happen in our life, too. Not everyone enjoys what God's doing in your life. It was no different for Nehemiah. Look at, look at chapter 2, verse 10. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites, they were gr- greatly displeased. They were greatly displeased. Right? So here's, here's Nehemiah's opposition. Okay, just like anything in life, you're going to have some opposition come, okay? And so we're introduced here to Nehemiah's opposition. Nehemiah, as he goes back and builds these walls, he's going to have three primary opponents who want to get him off track, who want to discourage him in any way they possibly can. I've heard these people called border bullies in our life, right? That they're just there waiting for you to discourage you, to get you to give in and give up. Uh, They're going to do everything in their power to get you off track, okay? Which brings us to our second point. We need to be faithful to follow even when opposition arises. Even when opposition arises. Look at, verses, look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 now. Here's the opposition. When Sambalat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria. And he said to them, What are these, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up what they were building, he would break down their stone wall. Okay, so you can hear it in their voices, right? They are extremely excited that these walls are getting rebuilt, aren't they? No, right? No, not at all. They're disgusted. 
They, they can't believe it's happening, right? They, they are up, so upset that these walls are getting rebuilt. They're just like schoolyard, schoolyard bullies, aren't they? Bullies. And so we've all experienced them. Hopefully nobody in this room has ever been one of those. But if you have, Jesus loves you and you can repent today, right? So we've all experienced bullies. Be, bullies are people who do their absolute best to get in the way of what God wants you to do. Specifically with what we're addressing today, bullies will try to get you to give in and give up on what God has called you to. Right? So after amen, you've prayed, you've prayed and prayed, God's called you to something, bullies are going to be right there waiting for you, trying to get you to give in, give up, and get out of whatever God's called you to do. And so these three border bullies, they take it upon themselves to be this guy, these people for Nehemiah. They start trash talking him, right? They start trying to resist him. They're tr- doing their best to bring discouragement to Nehemiah and his workers. But here's the thing. The talk didn't work, Okay. The trash talk didn't work. Nehemiah kept on building. He kept on moving. He kept on leading his people. And so guess what? The trash talk didn't stop. They started doing other things. After trash talk didn't work, they went a little further. Go read verses 7 and 8 now. Chapter 4, it says, When Sambala, Tobiah, and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashadites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw it into confusion. Okay, so trash talk didn't work. So now they step up their game a little bit, right? They form a plan. Now we're going to all work together and fight against Nehemiah and his people. And so Nehemiah, though, is filled with the Lord. He continues to be faithful to follow God, even amidst this opposition. He continues to turn to the Lord in prayer, and he fights back. And so this next part that we're going to read, I want to show you what it looks like to stand faithful and follow Jesus even in amidst opposition. Here's this picture that we get. It's an awesome picture, verses 15 through 21. So they got some opposition, and this is their response, Nehemiah and his men's response. Look at verse 15. When our enemies heard that we, were, that their, we knew their scheme and that God had frustrated it, every one of us returned to his own work on the wall. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half held spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers supported all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the wall. The laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held a weapon with the other. Each of the builders had his sword strapped around his waist while he was building, and the trumpeter was beside me. And then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is enormous and spread out, and we are separated far from one another along the wall. Whenever you hear the trumpet sound, rally to us there, and our God will fight for us. So we continued the work while half of my men were holding spears from daybreak until the stars came out. All right, so Nehemiah was not going to give up, right? They formed this plan that even when they're working, they're going to hold their sword and fight off the enemy and continue to build the wall all at the same time, right? What a picture to be faithful to follow even in the midst of opposition. So Nehemiah knew what God called him to do, and there was nothing going to get in the way of that. He wasn't going to give in and give up just because of some bullies. And neither were the people, right? Nehemiah was such a great leader that all of these people said, hey, you know what? We're bought into the vision. We're bought into the mission. This is is what we're called to do. And so they continued to build back. They continued to do what God had called them to do. I think today that this is an excellent example for me and you to be faithful to follow, even in the face of opposition. Here's the deal. You may feel like today in your life that people are rallying against you, right? And that your life is very difficult and challenging. Here's the truth. It probably is, right? If you feel that way, it probably is. It probably is challenging. I want you to take encouragement from this. Nehemiah, at this moment in his life, was that easy? Absolutely not, right? I'm sure holding the sword in one hand and like laying brick and mortar down in the other was pretty difficult, pretty challenging. That was a real struggle that they were uh, facing, right? But here's the key to this, is that they chose to remain faithful, right? They didn't duck out. They didn't didn't give in on what uh, God had called them to do. After amen, you and I need to learn how to do this. We need to learn how to be steadfast in what God has called us to, right? To continue on and be faithful to what God has called us to. Don't allow people, words, setbacks, or anything in your life to get in the way of what God has called you to do, right? Don't allow any of those things to get in the way. Keep moving forward. Keep pushing towards what you know God has called you to do. When life doesn't add up or make sense and you think it's crushing around on you, choose to remain faithful to him no matter what. So Nehemiah and his men do that, right? They continue to build build the wall even amidst these three oppressors. And this is going to bring us to our final point from Nehemiah today is that the third thing, we need to be faithful to follow all the way to completion. 
all the way to completion, right? They're building a wall. They have an end goal here. And so look, let's look at uh, chapter 6 now, verses 15 and 16. It says this, The wall was completed in 52 days, on the 25th day of the month of Elul. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. All right, after amen, Nehemiah finishes the task that God has called him for all the way to completion, right? He saw it, he saw it through. He saw it all the way to completion. Nehemiah, the cupbearer, and some guys with swords, pretty much, right? These are just regular, average Joes kind of people. They build a wall back in 52 days. That's pretty quick, right? 52 days, building walls and gates back, that's, that's awesome. And so here's the deal. All the stuff that they were up against, all the opposition, all the, all the, the naysayers, the doubters, and here's another thing, all the legitimate concerns from themselves, right? All the doubt, all the negativity that they probably had in their own minds of like, hey, am I qualified to build the wall, right? I'm not an architect. I don't know how to do this, right? I'm just a cupbearer. Who are we to do this? All of those things, and God still used them and used them swiftly. So much so that who gets the glory? Was it, was it Nehemiah that received the glory for these walls getting rebuilt? No, it was God, because it was done so swiftly, so fast, and by these regular people that God receives the glory. So it was built back so strong that Nehemiah and his people also, uh, that the opposition that had once been bullying them, now was intimidated by who? By God, because they recognized that God was in this, not just humans, right? Not just humans. So what a way for us to end today. Me and you, need to, we need to be faithful to follow all the way. Here's the deal. Don't give up. Don't lose sight. Don't lose heart of what God's called you to. And whenever you finish strong, God's going to receive the glory in the end. Right? Not you, not man. God's going to receive the glory in the end. I want you to think about this. When God's called you to something, uh, initially there could probably, hopefully, there is some sort of excitement about that calling. Right? There's some excitement. Like whenever I got a call in the ministry as a sophomore, I was excited. A little fearful, but I was excited. And so God calls you into something like Nehemiah. In your first few days of your project, you're probably really, really excited, right? You're, uh, you're recognizing your calling. You're full of joy. You're starting something new. You recognize that God's called you to do it. And um, you're probably whistling while you work, right? You're like, man, what is work? I got to come do this every day, right? This is, this is who I am. And so then here's the thing. Opposition is going to come. Inevitably, opposition is going to come. And you're going to have a choice in that moment. You're going to have a choice. How am I going to respond to this? Are, am I going to continue and press on through it? Or am I just going to give in and give up? Because the opposition has come. And then Nehemiah gets to this one part, the dog days, you could call it, right? Because even though you're called to something, doesn't mean that it doesn't sometimes get mundane or sometimes you don't go through the ringer in life yourself, anything like that, right? And so I like to call this the dog days. And I'm sure at one point building this wall, they were in dog days, if you know what I mean, Right? Probably the moment that they're all holding swords in one hand and trying to build the wall with the other, I'm sure it looked like the progress just stopped completely, right? That, where's this wall going? We're not even making a dent in the thing, right? The progress was probably at a standstill, and they had a choice. Man, this is difficult. Should we just give up right now? Should we just go home now, right? Good luck, Jewish remnant. Sorry about you. But here's the deal. They, didn't pre they continued to press on. And 52 days later, God receives the glory for it. God receives the glory for it because of their faithfulness to follow him. As we transition to close the day, I got this question for you that we're going to end with. What have you been praying for lately? What have you been praying to God for lately? How have you been approaching him lately? Maybe you've been praying and praying and you don't feel like God's giving you the answer that you want. Here's the, here's the deal. Maybe God's calling you to be that answer, right? Maybe God's placed a burden in your heart that can only be accomplished by you through him. Just like Nehemiah, right? Nobody else was equipped for that task. Nobody else was uh, given a special moment before the king for this task. Nehemiah had to follow through. After amen, a lot of times God wants to use us. After amen. God gave Nehemiah the burden. He equips Nehemiah, and he was the answer to that burden. Maybe today you've been praying and praying and praying, and now it's just time for you to step out in faith and go do it. Right? You have something in your heart that God, you feel like God's called you to do, my encouragement to you today would be follow that calling. Pursue that, right? Step out in faith today. Put a stake in the ground and say, Jesus, I'm following whatever, whatever you're leading me to do. Here's something else. That lost family member that you can't get it off of your heart, that you've been praying for and praying for and praying for, 
Here's the deal. Maybe God wants to use you today to go share your faith, to go ask them if they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, right? Be bold in your faith to go do that. So the first thing, be faithful to follow God even when it doesn't make sense. Remember this, Nehemiah was a cupbearer, right? A cupbearer to a king, and God turned him into a contractor for the king. It could be as wild as this today, right? It could be, it could be that maybe you're not truly following God's call on your life, right? You're sitting here today, and you feel like God's got a burden on your life for something completely different than whatever you're doing currently right now. Maybe you need to embrace God's true call for your life and surrender to what he's wanting you to do. And you might be thinking to yourself, man, that is absolutely insane, right? I can't, I can't uproot my life 45 years in or uh, 60 years in or even 25 years in. Here's the deal. I would, I would point you to the disciples, okay? They uprooted their life for the cause of Jesus, and Jesus changed the world through regular, ordinary people because of their faithfulness to follow God's call. So maybe that's you today. Maybe today you need to say yes to what God's truly burdened on your heart and go pursue that. Second thing is this. Be faithful to follow even in the face of opposition. You might be sitting here today and you feel like God's been distant from you, that he's been letting you go through the ringer of life. My encouragement would you, with, to you would be to stay. Stay, stay with your relationship with Jesus. Don't let the border bullies of life throw off what God has called you to, to do. And lastly, faithful to follow all the way to completion. A lot of you out here today, you just need to continue to trust Trust that God's called you. Trust that God's got you where you need to be. And you need to see it through. And God receives the glory from it. Sure, there's going to be times of opposition, heartache. But look at Nehemiah. He went through a lot of those times, right? Look at Nehemiah's ending. When you stick to it, it's worth it in the end. God will be glorified. So as we transition to a time of close today, if everyone could just stand up, bow your head with me. Currently, as we're in a time of prayer uh, through these 21 days of prayer, uh, personally, but also corporately with our church, after amen, a lot of times is when God calls me and you into action, right? It's when God wants us to step out in faith and pursue after what he's called us to. So today, maybe you're sitting out here and you feel that burden. You feel like, I know God's been calling me to do something. Maybe you know what it is. Maybe you don't know what it is. My encouragement today would be to, to just say yes. Say yes and continue to move to him, to pursue whatever he's burdened in your heart. Maybe he's calling you today to lead a small group, right? You've, you've, had, you've been in a small group for a while and you want to start leading a small group. Do it. Step out in faith and do it. Maybe God's calling you to join one. You've been on the fence lately, last semester or two, about, hey, should I, should I truly join a small group? Should I, should I step outside of my comfort zone and go walk through Scripture with a group of believers? My encouragement today would be do that. Join one. Maybe he's calling you today to disciple or personally invest in somebody else. If you want to strengthen your faith, that's probably one of the greatest things you can do is start investing in somebody else and walking scripture, walking through scripture with somebody else. Do that. Maybe if today you're feeling the burden to be generous with what God's blessed you with. You feel like you have a lot of resources, time, money, whatever it may be, and God's calling you to step out and start giving more of those resources to the Lord. Whatever it is today, I would encourage you, follow that call. Follow faithfully to what God's wanting to do in your life. Today, maybe you're currently experiencing opposition. Don't quit. Don't give up. Be willing to continue the work God has called you to with a sword in one hand and while working in the other. And I love that picture because what is the sword that we are given? It's God's word, right? It's Jesus' word. And so here's, the, here's that real picture that Nehemiah and the people in the face of opposition, they hold close to God's word while they're working, right? They hold close to God's promises while they're continuing to be faithful to him. They stay near to Jesus while working on the wall. Today, it's no different for me and you, right? We need to be faithful to remain close to Jesus while we're doing what he's called us to do. Maybe today you just need encouragement to continue, can carry on to completion and give God the glory when you do. Today, would you be willing to open your heart to the Lord and ask him to identify where you're at? What's he calling you to? What's he calling you to? What do you need to do today to faithfully follow after God? Dear Heavenly Father, we just come forward today. We thank you for the, uh, the, lesson, the, the, the lesson from Nehemiah today to faithfully follow after you in whatever you've called us to. God, I just pray for your Holy Spirit in this room right now, Lord, that if there's, if there's people in here that that recognize that you've given them a burden on their heart, 
today, Lord, and that they're, they've been a little fearful to step out in faith and pursue it. God, I pray that you would crush the enemy today, Lord, that you would crush their uh, fear, Lord, that you would allow them to say, here I am, send me for whatever that may be, Lord. I pray that we would have people today that their lives would be forever changed by them stepping out in faith and following you after amen. There's others in this room today, though, that here's the thing. You can't faithfully follow something that you've never first followed, right? You can't faithfully follow something you never first followed. Maybe today you recognize or realize that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And in order to faithfully follow after Jesus, you have to first know who Jesus is. And so here's my encouragement to you today. If you recognize that, today I would like you to have an opportunity to respond to the Lord. Here's the, here's the true story is that Jesus loves you so much that he came, lived a perfect, sinless life for you and for me, right? So that our sins may be wiped clean by professing him as our Lord and Savior, confessing our sins and giving him our lives. And so today, if you feel like you need to form and, and have a personal relationship with Jesus, you can do that. Today, if you feel like you need to make Jesus your Savior and Lord and you're ready to start faithfully following after Jesus Christ, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that Christ has died on the cross for my sins and then rose from the dead. Please forgive me of all my sin. Today I turn away from sin and confess you as Lord and trust you alone for my salvation. Thank you for your love, your forgiveness, and your free gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's celebrate everybody that made that decision this morning.